today we have Tobias Fritz. Some of you uh, have already heard about Markov category in the previous events on categorical probability. So these seem to be a very nice categorical framework for talking about probability in terms of category theory, in terms of arrows. Uh, so Tobias, welcome and please, the stage is yours. Yeah, thank you. Um, so yeah, it's great to be back uh, at the MIT category seminar, even if it's online now, uh, or maybe especially that it's online now. Um, so this is part of um, well, the ongoing developments in, in categorical probability, which really is, is, is a subject that seems to be you know, gaining momentum at the moment. And, and, and a lot of things are somehow turning out to be possible, which maybe were not expected um, previously. Um, so my original title, as you may have seen, was probability theory with Markov categories. But while preparing the talk, I realized that that's actually there's a different spin that one can put in it and maybe in some sense a better spin. And so it, one of the things that I'm going to <clears throat> argue is that um, Markov categories are actually a theory of information flow and that also probability theory itself, when you consider it somehow maximally generalized, is a theory of information flow, that that is a, a more intuitive word for, for what this is about. Okay, but before getting to that, let me just kind of do the necessary thing and kind of flash the list of references, uh, at least the main ones. There's certainly other ones. So um, <clears throat> Markov categories by now have been reinvented with some minor variations um, a couple of times independently. Um, and so the m maybe most um, important first paper is the one by uh, Cho and Jacobs, disintegration, version, inversion via string diagrams. But turns out that there was also in the 90s a uh, sequence of papers by a Russian author, uh, Petr Galyutsov, who's done um, more or less the same things. Um, <clears throat> Uh, and then there's my long paper from last year where Markov categories were developed um, quite a bit further and, and more, more in terms of theory um, and, and proving theorems about them and using them. Uh, and then there's a, a paper uh, on, on, on zero one laws. Um, there's other stuff that is happening at the moment also in particular Evan's talk um, next week. The Markov categories, I suspect, will also feature. Um, yeah, there's a couple of other things like Brendan Fong's um, master's thesis, but but I'll get to that. All right. So <clears throat> before introducing Markov categories, since this is the applied category theory community, many of us really like uh, reasoning about processes in terms of string diagrams, or just using string di diagrams in general. Um, and so then we have these wires and boxes, wires representing things that um, kind of systems. Um, <clears throat> and a system is an input, can be an input uh, to a process. And so a process takes the system as input, produces another system as output. Um, and then we have string diagrams like this. If we compose these processes into networks, um, yeah, so this is the standard uh, kind of thing that I'm sure most of you will have seen, some kind of recipe cooking. So I'm uh, not as sophisticated as lemon moringa pie, so it's just uh, an apple pie recipe. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so <clears throat> this is what, what, what string diagrams are about and what they're useful for. Um, and the point that I want to make here is that these are in some sense typically or, or often real processes um, take that, that can take place in a physical world. But now suppose that we want to talk about things more like information um, and information flow and information processing. Um, so for example, let's say you want to mm, devise some kind of model of a medical trial. So then um, we have um, um, medical conditions and the medical condition as a patient of a patient would be our initial system. Uh, and then we have a treatment outcome. Um, and then there's a bunch of things that that, that treatment outcome depends on. Um, in particular, in medical trial, 
the outcome will depend on whether um, the patient will actually comply with uh, the prescriptions of, of taking the, the drugs or, or whatever. Um, and the compliance, just as the treatment outcome itself, um, will depend on the medical condition in principle. Someone who's more sick than someone who's pretty healthy um, is more likely to actually comply, I suppose. Um, <clears throat> So here, that means the medical condition has an influence both on the compliance and on the treatment. And on the, the, the treatment, the influence on the treatment is both indirectly through via the compliance and kind of obviously also directly. So, so it seems that um, to talk about this sort of information flow, that, that the information about a medical condition flows into or the has this influence on the compliance and on the treatment, uh, we can't just use plain the, these vanilla type string diagrams because these don't have enough structure to, to express um, this dual role of, of the medical condition here. So we need some kind of additional thing which denotes the idea that we want to copy this medical, the information contained, the information about the medical condition. Uh, and this is so this is what the black dot denotes. Oh, and I yeah, I, I forgot to mention that my string diagrams go from from bottom to top, kind of because of my I guess mainly because of my physics uh, background and interest. <clears throat> uh, where time goes upwards. So so copy means it well takes one thing as input and produces two things as outputs, and those are to be thought of as copy. So this means that a theory of information flow will need some additional pieces of structure um, in just rather than just a monoidal category, symmetric monoidal category, namely um, something that denotes copying information, sort of like a, co a kind of co-multiplication. Um, and also, we also would like to be able to delete information. Um, then we have this just black dot um, at the bottom, sort of a co-unit. Um, and so this leads to the following definition of Markov category. Um, oh, oops, sorry. I did not. For some reason, my computer is very slow at the moment. Okay, now it should be back, right? All right. Yes, so no problem. A yeah, a Markov category um, is hence a symmetric monoidal category equipped with these structures, and so copying and deleting operations in every object, which well are of those types, uh, and satisfying a bunch of conditions that we would naturally expect copying and deleting to satisfy, namely that uh, these make every object into a commutative co-monoid in a canonical way. So the co-multiplication or the copying is co-associative, uh, commutative, and um, <clears throat> co-unital. So if I copy the information and delete one of the two copies again, that's just the same as keeping the information and doing nothing to it. <clears throat> uh, and uh, while these pieces of structure have to interact with well of the monoidal structure, uh, in, in a sense that I now haven't uh, written down. It's, it's the same as in the general theory of, of supplies that Brandon and David have developed. Um, <clears throat> and there's an additional condition that, that if you process information and discard it, then that's the same as just discarding it from the start. Um, and there are some indications that maybe we don't actually want this, uh, or at least someone can do still a lot of things without, and sometimes even more things without, but still, it's it's a very useful and natural uh, condition to have around. So for now, for for the purposes of this talk, I'm going to be assuming it. <clears throat> All right. So the basic example is um, Finstock, uh, the category of finite sets and and stochastic matrices or, or stochastic maps. So in, usually, information flow uh, is not necessarily or when when you feed information into a process. 
well, the outcome, what, what the output of the process is typically not uniquely determined, but there may be some randomness in it. Uh, and so we should expect um, the definition of Markov category to be able to capture this kind of randomness that, that um, processing may, um, may give rise to. And, and this is captured, for example, by Finstock or by many other categories, um, placely categories of probability monads, this kind of thing. But for now, let me just introduce Finstock. So the, the objects are finite sets um, and amorphisms are stochastic matrices, um, which means, so I actually like to use conditional probability notation uh, for these because that's exactly what, what this encodes, that, that it's a matrix indexed by the elements of the domain set X and the codomain set Y and the elements in our F of little X given little FF of little Y given little X. And this denotes the conditional, the, the probability of getting an output little Y when the input is little X. Um, and so then these should satisfy the axioms of, um, of probability that they're non-negative uh, values and, and sum to one when you sum over the outputs for every value of the input. Um, yeah, these compose via what's called a chapman Kolmogorov formula. That's, um, <clears throat> it's, it's the obvious thing that, that you would expect. That the randomness involved in the two processes is independent and so the probabilities multiply, but the intermediate state is not observed, so we just kind of sum over it. It doesn't matter which, what the value of y of, of the intermediate thing is um, for determining the relation between the overall input and overall output. Sorry, this should be an x here on the right. Oh, and if there are any questions, feel free to, to interrupt so that I have maybe get some feedback of, to see to what extent uh, people are following or, or lost. Okay, so in particular, morphism from the, the just the, the terminal set, the one element set one, uh, two x, when now the input is trivial, there is only one input value. So hence we get a probable, just a probability distribution uh, on x. A general morphism, well, has many, many kind of names. As I said, it's a sort of process with randomness involved, um, often also called Markov kernel. That, that's what Markov categories are named after as, as categories of Markov kernels. Or, or generalized categories of Markov kernels, uh, but also probabilistic mapping or communication channel information theory. These are all really synonymous. Okay, so, well, I haven't said yet how this is actually a symmetric monoidal category. So the monoidal structure is just given again by doing things independently, but now in parallel. Um, where independently is supposed to be understood in the in the sense of probability theory of stochastic independence, multiplying probabilities again, probability of getting outputs x and y given inputs a and b for a joint process is just you do compute the individual probabilities and then multiply them by independence. Uh, yeah, so this now we have a symmetric monoidal category. Um, but not yet a Markov category, because for that we need to say what the copy and deleting maps are. So the copy maps, well, it's just the obvious thing of, of copying information. Um, and in this case, there is no randomness involved. So all the probabilities are zero or one. And the probability of getting outputs x1 and x2 when the input is x, well, it just should be one when these two outputs are equal to the input, both, uh, and zero otherwise. So that's just the obvious notion of copying um, the value of x. And the deletion maps, well, there, there is a unique morphism to the monoidal unit one um, from every x, and so these are the deletion maps. The, um, the normalization axiom here at the bottom, together with interacting well with the monoidal structure, is actually equivalent to saying that the monoidal unit is terminal. So we don't really need to care, but making clear what the deletion maps are. They're, they're automatically unique. And then it's, yeah, pretty simple to check that all these axioms actually hold. Any, any questions on this? All right, so uh, the rest of the talk, I'll, I'll sketch, although I don't really have time for a lot of 
for all the technical details, how one can develop some theorems of probability theory in terms of Markov categories. Uh, and in some cases, well, making such developments as, as we all know in category theory, uh, generalizing theorems uh, from other areas of mathematics may, may involve turning them into definitions. So in some cases we can prove theorems from probability theory, in other cases we have to turn them into definitions as apparently, or at least then we haven't found a way of turning them into theorems yet, but at least we may have ways of turning them into definitions. Uh, but on the other hand, so there is um, a vast landscape of Markov categories. Uh, and so Finstock, it, it has a bunch of variants from other probability monads, as I've mentioned, but there are actually a lot of other types of Markov categories out there. And so far these have barely been explored at all. And, and so one can instantiate a theories, theorems from the previous item on these um, Markov categories so that so they become more general than, than just applying in the context of probability theory. But so far it's, um, yeah, we really have little idea of what, what they instantiate to. Um, so, so we're just at the beginning with all of this. But in terms of these two items, um, I feel like there's some kind of at least vague analogy with topos theory in a sense that topos theory also has these two kinds of features it's, it's a very powerful framework for um, developing mathematics in the sense that every piece of mathematics that has a constructive, every theorem that has a constructive proof holds in every topos. Um, and, and so this, so, so that means we can just reason as if we were to reason, reasoning about sets more or less. Um, but still, there are a lot of topuses around there, and they may not be so. This may not be so obvious, especially if you just learn topus theory from the, the, the first time. If you just became become familiar with it, um, <clears throat> but but again, one can then instantiate all of these theorems, const every constructive piece piece of mathematics in every topus, and that's a really powerful principle. Um, and so I'm hoping that, that maybe something like this will also um, turn out to be the case from, or seems to be the case from Markov categories. Uh, also in topos theory, there's a hierarchy of additional axioms that one can impose on toposes, like, well, in a Boolean topos, you can use the law of excluded middle, um, and then you can prove stronger theorems. And I think this, the same is true for Markov categories. So proving the theorems of probability theory typically will involve some additional axioms, but depending on the theorem, um, it, those axioms will, will be different. So there's a hierarchy, a whole sort of post set, at least of, of additional axiom systems. Okay, so overall, another uh, working hypothesis um, that I have is, is that the theory of Markov categories is, as I've sketched um, at the beginning, roughly a general theory of information flow. But on the other hand, it's also a sort of about probability theory. And, and so the perspective that I've arrived at is actually that probability theory, when you suitably generalize it um, in this categorical perspective is actually synonymous with a theory of information flow. And we can see this a little bit more concretely and maybe in what I'm going to show. Um, so in particular, this is from, uh, from uh, what, what Brandon Fong did in his master's thesis, what can define Bayesian networks and, and Markov categories. I mean, Markov categories didn't yet have that name at, at, at a time and, and um, didn't, yeah, hardly even existed in the literature at all. Um, so he didn't do this very explicitly. <clears throat> um, but yeah, this, um, should be, is, is actually in some sense what I already showed here in the medical trial. This is more or less a Bayesian network, um, a way of a, a, a process where you have random things taking place um, and, and then processing between those and then you get some output variables, overall output variables. Uh, and there's a certain network structure. That's what Bayesian networks are about. Um, so we can, we can define these. 
Um, but as far as I know, the moments uh, until now, and, and I think this is something that that is actually currently under under development to some extent, uh, is that we can do a causal inference in Markov categories. So if my hypothesis is correct, um, and I see no reason for why this shouldn't be possible, it should be possible to generalize um, the theory of causal inference to Markov categories. So causal inference is, is um, a theory which tries to make statements about what actually is the network structure when you only observe a bunch of, uh, you, you only make a bunch of observations, but you don't know what kind of network has, has given rise to those observations, has generated those observations. And causal inference tries to, um, well, infer what, what the network was. And um, given that the causal inference that I know, uh, it, my impression is that this pretty much directly generalizes to all Markov categories uh, with suitable additional axioms like conditional, there needs conditionals and things like that. So conditional probabilities, but those are, we know how to make sense of those. So this is one example of a theoretical development that should be possible, but hasn't really been conducted yet. Okay. <clears throat> um, a theoretical development that, that is already being used, um, I, I guess by, by some of you, uh, is based in inversion. Uh, so this is from the paper of Cho and Jacobs. Um, and I've written this now in a bit of a, a forum, which is directly illustrates the connection to how Bayesian inversion usually works in probability theory. So Bayesian inversion is that when you have um, a joint distribution, so two variables x and y, uh, then you can express the joint distribution in terms of just the probability of, of the distribution of x and then the conditional distribution of y given x. Uh, and so in terms of Markov categories, that corresponds to this diagram on the left. And so you can see we just generate the value of x. We keep one copy around um, and we feed the other copy into the conditional distribution of y given x. And so then the output is the distribution of y. And that exactly mirrors as a string diagrammatic version of, of this algebraic expression. Uh, and where the copying is also perfectly manifest in that there are two occurrences of x. Okay, and so now what Bayesian inversion does is to turn this around uh, and instead regard x uh, as sort of depending on y or yeah, to, to <clears throat> consider um, y as the variable is generated first uh, and then you feed that feed one copy into the conditional distribution of x. And so Bayesian inversion is the map sort of from the, um, from the left hand side to the conditional in some sense. So P of X given Y, we can now write this as the left hand side divided by P of Y in the usual discrete probability. Um, but yeah, this, this can be generalized and, and say that whenever such a morphism exists in a Markov category, then we call it the conditional. Um, and well, it's not unique, but it's not unique in, in the street, not, not even in usual discrete probability theory. It wasn't unique to begin with because of issues of, of zero over zero. Um, so, so this can be generalized and this is Bayesian inversion. Uh, and one can show that there's a sense in which this map, so it, it takes, somehow takes a morphism from X to Y, turns it into a morphism from Y to X, also has good compositional properties, namely that's a dagger functor. Um, which is maybe one exactly what one might expect as a category of theorist when you have a, a map that reverses the direction of morphisms. <clears throat> okay, another thing I can talk about is, is um, and, and so this is what I'm going to need uh, before I'll, I'll state one of the theorems that we've proven, uh, the zero one law of, of you with Savage, which is, um, uh, classical result of, of measure of theoretic probability. Um, and so this, this requires the notion of determinism. So <clears throat> amorphism is deterministic if it commutes with copying, meaning that if this, if this string diagram equation holds. So the intuition here is that if you 
um, apply f to two independent to, to two copies of the input, and then you look at the two outputs that you get, and then well that should be the same thing as um, just applying f to a single copy of the input and then copying the output. Um, and so one way to understand this is to say that well f is actually independent of itself, um, but that sounds maybe a little obscure. But you can understand it very or very intuitively by noting that. Um, on, the on, on the right hand side, these two outputs are always the same if you now think about what this means in, in the case of Finstock. The two outputs on the right are always the same, but on the left, they're always the same only if f actually does nothing random. Well, if f sometimes applies some randomness and so the output is not uniquely determined by the input, then these two outputs may some, are sometimes are going to have non-zero probability if we're going to be different. And so then the equation would not hold. So this equation says exactly that f should be deterministic or in the case of Finstock, uh, just being a zero one valued stochastic matrix. All right, so in, in general, any Markov category, the deterministic morphisms form a Cartesian monoidal subcategory. So the, basically by definition, the monoidal structure turns out to be actually the categorical product. <clears throat> um, yeah, we can also talk about conditional independence um, or define this now what, what this means in any Markov category. So conditional independence is supposed to mean that when you have a process which takes one input, produces two outputs, we'd like to say that once we know the value of the input, well then the outputs may be still random, may not necessarily be uniquely determined, but they're random in an independent way. Um, and so this is what this equation says, that there is no correlation or, or cross dependence between the outputs other than what is determined by or what is induced from, from the input. Okay, so before um, I can state our version of, of the Uvid Savage zero one law, well, I need to, I'd like to state the usual um, formulation of it. And so this is uh, closely related. And but before that, I'd actually like to remind everyone or um, introduce uh, the law, the strong law of large numbers. So this is now more just in conventional probability theory notation. You can perfectly think of these xi's as just uh, taking, let's say, taking on finally many values and being real valued. So these are real, val yeah, real valued random variables uh, and they're assumed to be independent and identically distributed. So they're just s s sort of, for example, um, dice, right? You, you throw die n times, you get uh, outcome one to six and then this would be the xi's. <clears throat> the individual outcomes. So the left-hand side is then the average value and in the limit um, as n goes to infinity, um, well, this may or may not converge. It depends on a particular realization of, of your dice throws. Um, but this says that uh, the probability that it does converge and that a limit is equal to the expectation value, um, that is that probability is one. That's the law of large numbers. Um, this is one of the things where we don't yet know how to state and, and prove this in terms of Markov categories. Um, maybe I'll say a little bit about it at the end. Um, but there's a, a closely related uh, classical result which we have proven synthetically, meaning in terms of Markov categories, and that's the, the Ewitt Savage zero one law. And here again, in, in the classical formulation, we have these uh, independent and identically distributed random variables. And now instead of just talking about this average and, and the conversions and the limit, we'll just look at any event, any sort of function of the xi's. So, or think of it as a, as a predicate, which, which depends on all the xi's um, and which is invariant under finite permutations of the xi's. Uh, so the conversions on, on top uh, in this equation is independent about when we just do finitely many rearrangements of the xi's that doesn't affect the limit. So the general statement assumes any such a, uh, and then the claim is that the theorem says that the probability of such a is actually zero or one. So it's, it's deterministic. 
but Ethereum doesn't tell you which one of these two things happen. It, it's it's really kind of strange in that way. But um, and so yeah, you can apply this in a situation of large large numbers, uh, and then conclude that the probability of it converging to the expectation value is zero or one, but it doesn't tell us which. So, but at least it's a statement going in that direction. Okay, so here's our synthetic uh, formulation in terms of Markov categories. Um, I don't want to, or don't have the time to really explain this in all detail, but just sort of maybe to give the flavor of it. So this is from my paper with Eigel. Um, <clears throat> and uh, this, yeah, uses an additional axiom, the so-called, what, what, uh, what I've called causality axiom for Markov categories. Um, and then is, is concerned with actually a somewhat more general setting than the U.S. Savage zero one law. So instead of this event, which would be a, a predicate, we now are going to have um, a deterministic morphism taking values in any other object. It doesn't need to take val values in anything like truth values. <clears throat> uh, and instead of just having a probability distribution uh, of infinitely many random variables, we now have a morphism, which is not necessarily just a distribution in the sense of having the monoidal unit one as the domain, but having any domain A. So it's somehow more parametric in A. Yeah. Um, and this involves um, another concept from, from the theory of Markov categories, Kolmogorov uh, products and Kolmogorov powers that, that, that we had also introduced. These are a version of infinite monoidal products so well, when you have to, the object X, we can, for any finite set, we can take F many um, tensor products of X with itself. But for, for the theorem, we actually need infinitely many. And so the way that this is defined is in terms of um, a directed limit, a co-filtered limit over all these finite tensor products. And well, there's uh, projections between those. So we can ask if the limit exists uh, and have an, an an additional preservation condition that makes it into a Kolmogorov power. Yeah, and then as in a classical theorem, we have the invariance condition. Uh, well, here we actually have two invariance conditions. Um, that's, these, these are also contained and, and the classical one is saying that the XI should be independent and identically distributed. So there's also the invariance condition there. And, and so it's, it's uh, exactly analogous. Yeah. Um, except that this is in some sense more general. And then the, the claim, the, the result is that uh, the comp composite SP is deterministic. So going from this parameter space A to the truth values object T. <clears throat> uh, and then that instantiates in this particular case to the probabilities being a zero one. All right, so the proof, uh, yeah, is, is by string diagrams, but, but still, well, the other mathematicians sometimes may scoff at string diagrams because it looks trivial, but the proof is actually not trivial um, it, or not obvious from just the statement, even if you fit, try to fiddle around with string diagrams a little. All right, so, so this um, was part one and, and that I wanted to indicate what sort of theoretical developments one, one can perform with Markov categories. Oh, and, and by the way, um, Right, the, 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 um, to, to finish this up, let me maybe just indicate again how I've arrived to this perspective that it's better to call this or maybe to at least to think of this as being about information flow instead of being about probabilities and probability distributions. Uh, and that also this theorem is, is very much about a flow of information and that the, the information here somehow goes from A to this Kolmogorov power VFP, and then we apply S to that and it ends up in T. And overall, we make a statement about a flow of information from A to T via this, this Kolmogorov power. And, and the usual, usual sort of formulations of pro, uh, usual theorems of probability theory where everything has is assumed to have a joint distribution and so on doesn't, doesn't um, one can't see that kind of structure. I think as, as, as clearly. <clears throat> okay, and any, any questions on, on, on this? 
So there have been a couple of questions in the chat. Mm -hmm. So the first one was, is there a rigorous one line definition of um, causal inference? Oh, uh, I, mm, I don't think so in, in the sense that this is a, a sort of I'm sorry, you're muted, sorry. Can you repeat? Yeah, yeah, I, I, good. Um, I don't think that there can be a one line, let's say at least not mathematical definition of causal inference because this is a, I mean, a, an area of study, it's a scientific field. And so we can't really give one line definitions okay. or at least, yeah. I, um, but but the, the type of problem that causal inference tries to address is to try to infer um, a network structure and to disentangle a particular cause and effect. So causes are things that are more like in the input further down in the network, effects that are things that are further up, to disentangle these things and try to make inferences about the network structure from observations um, about the, the, the network and in particular observing outputs and correlations between outputs. I see. Okay, some people Just, are... Does that answer address the question? I don't know, uh, Arthur? Um, um, yes, yeah, I was just um, curious if you were thinking that Markov categories give you a model for such a definition, I guess. Um, what do you mean by a model? Or if you can use the structure of a Markov category to give such a definition. Uh, I, yes, that's actually, that's interesting. Um, I, it, it would not capture everything that people are trying to do that, that they call a causal inference, but it would, let's say, definitely, yes. So, so one can certainly, right, then give a, a definition of the, the, this main problem of causal inference that I've just sketched. Yes, I think so. But then there will still be other things that people call a causal inference. For example, what, what do you, how do you deal with having only finite statistics? How does that affect the problem? And, and, and all that, so, but yeah. But the, the main problem itself can, can then be captured, yes. Good point. Thank you. And there was also a question by David Spivak. David, has the question been addressed in the chat in the end? I think so, yeah, thanks. Okay, any more questions for, about this part of the talk? seems no, let me just mention that there's a little bit of discussion already in the chat about causal inference. Mm -hmm. And it seems very interesting. So I encourage these people to uh, continue that on slope, maybe at the end of the talk, because something nice may come out of it. Mm -hmm. For the rest, uh, please go, go ahead. Yeah, sounds great. So I can't even see the chat to the moment because of the screen sharing, I suppose. But I'd, I'd like to read it later. Um, yeah. Um, what was I? Oh, I, I forgot to mention, of course, I, I wanted to say the references. One of the uh, other develop, ongoing developments is, is uh, generalizations, extensions of Markov categories to, to quantum uh, theory, quantum probability by author in, in, in particular, has a number of quite interesting works in that I know. Okay, so, so this was the part about the theory and now I'd like to, um, my other item was to try and give a flavor of the landscape of, of Markov categories and the scope. Um, and I still feel like, so, so new things are still coming up. And so I feel like I'm still probably not able to sketch a complete picture of reasonably complete picture of how and where Markov categories can come up. Um, but let me say what I, what, what, what there is so far. <clears throat> so first of all, um, that's some of the, maybe the most basic and most important construction is that classic category, classic categories are sometimes but often Markov categories. Um, and so the proposition here is that if you have a category of finite products, C, and if uh, you have a commutative monad P on C, which is affine in the sense that a P of the terminal object is again isomorphic to the terminal object. 
like for um, a probability, a monad of probability distributions. So there is just one probability distribution on, on a one element set. <clears throat> then the classic category of P is a Markov category in let's say the obvious way. So using the, the, cat, uh, the, the categorical product of C um, for the, as the monoidal product. Uh, and then, yeah, the copy maps are just the, the diagonals that we have from the categorical product on C. <clears throat> but now they're in general, just no longer diagonals of, of, a, of the categorical product because the monoidal structure typically no longer is the categorical. Well, typically the classic category no longer has products even. So this is what happens when we get Finstock. Finstock arises, sorry, no, it doesn't because, but if we extend Finstock to all sets and finitely supported probability distributions, then it arises like this. Uh, and other monads, in particular for the jury monad, um, we can do this. So this is the probability monad going back to, to Lavier and, and, and Jiri uh, on measurable spaces. It's, it's classic category then is again one of the paradigmatic Markov categories for probability. We can also do things like the classic category, take the classic category of, non, of the power set monad. Uh, and then while well, the classic category is real, but to get a Markov category, there's the subtlety that we should just take the non-empty power set monad only, and then we get rel with sort of normalized relations. So that has to do with the normalization equation that I had shown a definition of Markov category, but it's almost rel. Uh, and also the, this proposition for constructing Markov categories still holds when C, C is not necessarily a Cartesian monoidal, but just merely a Markov category itself. So that's, you can use it to construct new Markov categories from given ones. Okay, uh, another large class of examples are categories of co-monoids. <clears throat> so when you have any symmetric monoidal category and you take co-monoids in it, um, then you get a Markov category. And so its objects are the co-monoids in C and um, its morphisms are going to be the morphisms of C, but those that preserve the co-unit of, um, that's, that's in order to get the, again, the normalization equation. Um, but so in general, a general morphism does not need to respect the co-multiplication in any way. So this seems maybe a little silly to, to then even introduce co-monoids to begin with. But the point is that the co-multiplication the, the, the co multiplications of the co-monoids are what specifies or defines now the copy maps in this category of co-monoids. So this, this is how that, that becomes the Markov category. And a good example or interesting, somewhat interesting example from a probability perspective um, is if we do this actually with VACT, vector spaces um, over a field K. Um, and oh, so yeah, I should op it. The op here is pretty much the working with um, predicate transformers as opposed to, as opposed to state transformers or equivalently in, in, in physics terms using the Heisenberg picture instead of the Schrodinger picture. Um, so meaning that we now think of these co-monoids in, in VACT op which will correspond to just K algebras, meaning monoids in VECT, as algebras of random variables, meaning K valued random variables. Um, and then the corresponding morphisms in the Markov category are going to be something like random variable transformers or to be thought of as formal opposites of Markov kernels. When we take uh, K to be R, then this is actually fairly close to, um, yeah, probably, traditional probability theory, much, much below that this, that this would allow negative probabilities. Okay, um, but now there, there are more examples um, coming from, yeah, of, of constructing new Markov categories out of given ones. Um, one of these is diagram categories. So this is again, maybe also like in a bit like in, uh, in Topos theory. Um, in, in that, uh, the, the doctrine of Markov categories is stable under suitable formation, formation of suitable diagram categories. So when you have any category D to index our diagrams, 
uh, then we can and, and see a Markov category. Then we can consider diagrams um, of shape C that take values in deterministic morphisms in C only. This is this an, an important um, subtlety here that, that the diagrams need to consist of deterministic morphisms. And then we can consider natural transformations between those with uh, arbitrary components in C, not necessarily deterministic. So if we use the, uh, apply this, for example, with the, the diagram shape D just being the integers considered as a poset, so we have arrows going from lower numbers to higher numbers, then we get a category of discrete time stochastic processes. So then this is, um, well, in case that you know a little bit about stochastic processes already, then this is the Markov category version of saying that we have a, a filtration of sigma algebras. <clears throat> and well, th this idea is really pretty old and, and, and goes back to Lovier's 1962 paper on the category of stochastic relations. But so this, this construction generalizes this formation of diagram categories to all Markov categories. Another thing that may be interesting, another kind of instance of this, is to take a group G and then just consider it as a single category um, as a category BG with a single object and just the G as the elements of G as somorphisms as usual. And then so then uh, the diagrams would be just objects of C equipped with a G action. And that way, again, we got, uh, um, yeah, Markov categories are stable under this construction. Um, and um, we can, again, get a notion of uh, dynamical systems with deterministic dynamics, but stochastic morphisms, if we take the group again to be the integers, for example. <clears throat> okay. Um, a speculative one is, um, so this may well be a non-example, I, I don't know, but at least I find it an intriguing um, direction to explore, is that maybe um, Markov categories may also be able to capture information theory so in, in, in the following sense, so as I said, Markov categories are ab about information flow or a sort of generalized probability theory. And, and so there's some well-known analogies between probability theory and information theory. Information theory, not really in the sense of entropies, namely that for example, conditional entropy behaves a lot like conditional probability. So if you take the formula for conditional probability up here, and you basically replace probability by entropy. Uh, and instead of taking multiplication and division, you, you turn this into, into adding and subtracting. Then the formula for conditional probabilities becomes the formula for conditional entropy, the, the chain rule for entropy. So it's somehow, since we can talk about Markov categories, since Markov categories provide a, a general setting to talk about conditioning, um, it's somehow tempting to think that or maybe we can also talk about conditional entropy like that. And um, so I don't think it will exactly work like this probably, but uh, I, I still suspect that there may be a Markov category for information theory, which may be able to explain these analogies and, and sort of make them into more than just analogies, but actually show how, they, how these are become instances of the same, of the same concepts. And, and um, one idea might be to take objects to be finite sets and to do a sort of construction that's similar to Finn's dog, but just takes into account information theories about asymptotics, as in when you do things in, in, in a many copy limit, um, as in many realizations of the same thing, and then look at asymptotic equivalences. So the morphisms maybe should be something like compatible families, instead of just being stochastic maps from X to Y, maybe there should be families of maps from a large uh, power of the set X to a large power of the set Y. Uh, and then modulo kind of the, the kind of asymptotic equivalence that one usually encounters in information theory. But I, I don't know yet. <clears throat> okay, and then there's, uh, um, this is actually not an example of, of a way of constructing Markov categories, but it's a, an intriguing idea for further applications, which emerged at, at the categorical probability and statistics workshop last last month. And um, so basically Peter Arndt uh, pointed this out, um, that there is this 
theory of um, hyperstructures in algebra, where one considers uh, structures which have, let's say, not a binary operation in the usual sense, which would assign a new element to any pair of given elements, but a hyper operation by which people mean that um, it's a multi-valued operation. You get a, a set of elements for any two given elements, or in another version of hyperstructures, you get a probability distribution over elements for any two given elements. So I, I think the Markov categories would also be a, um, a general setup to, to talk about these kinds of things and to, to try and develop categorical algebra for hyperstructures in a way that is analogous to how one can develop categorical algebra just for ordinary um, models of algebraic theories. Uh, and so, for example, we can we can define what a group is in a Markov category. Um, so usually, uh, well, a, a group is a in, in a Cartesian monoidal category. A group is a monoid G. We can talk about monoids in any symmetric monoidal category. So I won't unfold this this part any further. But just the uh, we need to be able to talk about inverses and to say that every element multiplied with its inverse um, results in the uh, results in the unit. Um, and this, in a Cartesian monoidal category, we can express this condition like this as a string diagram. You take any given element coming in from the bottom, you take two copies, you invert, you apply the inverse inversion map to one copy, and then you multiply them, uh, you multiply the resulting two elements. Um, and then you get an output, and that's supposed to be just the original element. So hence this equation. So this is, well, this is well known. I mean, this is the Hopf, the, the Hopf algebra equation, basically, the, which defines half algebras. But the, my point here is someone can interpret this now in any Markov category, where, because there we have to co-multiply the, the copy maps available, even if the category is not Cartesian. <clears throat> and so more generally, I think one can, one can consider models of any uh, algebraic theory in the sense of, in the sense of a Lovio theory in any Markov category. Um, and so, yeah, and in this way, trying to develop uh, categorical algebra for hyperstructures, which would then um, encompass both the, the hyperstructures in the sense of multi-valued operations, but also the hyperstructures in the sense of probability-valued, distribution-valued operations. Okay, I think this was pretty much the last um, thing that I had. So yeah, let me let me try to summarize. So so Markov categories are an emerging formalism for providing uh, a general theory of, well, this was supposed to be say, be saying information flow and information theory, sorry. Um, so, so I hope to have to have argued this for, for this. Um, <clears throat> and that many qualitative results of probability theory seem to generalize to Markov categories and thereby become uh, results about information flow in some sense. Um, and yeah, well, doing so usually requires some, some additional axioms and maybe I should re-emphasize it also in some cases which may require turning theorems into definitions. <laughs> okay, uh, and so on the other hand, there's a, a big unexplored territory of, of Markov categories in which one can instantiate those results. And, and, and so far, and, and the work that's been done so far, as, as far as I know, um, and, and maybe Evans' work is, is a, an inter a very interesting co counterpart, co counterpoint to this. Most of the work has, seems to have just looked at, um, yeah, instantiated results in categories that are classic categories of probability monads, or at least very similar to to, to those. And so, yeah, th this, um, these two features of having a powerful theory, but also many examples, I think, is somehow similar to. To, to, the situ, to the situation with uh, Topos theory. <clears throat> All right, um, there are maybe two more f further interactions that I'm personally quite, quite curious about. Um, and that, that um, especially the first one has been on my mind for a while, but somehow I haven't been able to, to make any, any progress in it. Um, and, and that, you know, there's a lot of different uh, concepts, types of probability measures that, that, that people study, and, and I think also for, for a good reason. Um, 
you know, different types of probability monads and different types of spaces. Um, but one can still wonder whether there maybe is the most convenient one. So, so by convenient, I do mean in, in the sort of convenient category sense, um, Markov category for mesh theoretic probability. Uh, and so here I have a list of, of, of desiderata and I don't actually know of any category. I, yeah, I haven't had time to really explain what, what all of these things mean, but I don't know of any category which satisfy all of these and uh, would yeah just exclude trivial examples, any non-Cartesian Markov category at all, regardless of whether models probability theory or, or something else, which has all of these, satisfies all of these properties. <clears throat> And finally, uh, a point that, that many people I think have pointed out starting with Lavier a long time ago is that um, um, we really should be also looking at enriched categories um, in, in order to be able to capture things like the law of large numbers uh, and, and many of the statements of probability theory which are quantitative rather than qualitative. So as I said, I think the uh, yeah, qualitative results of probability theory uh, seem to be quite amenable to, to this kind of generalization, but the coin of the other ones are certainly something to, to struggle with. Um, and so it seems somehow natural to try and see how far we can go by looking at enriched Markov categories and in particular enrichment in the metric spaces, of course, to talk about approximations, but there may also be reasons to look at other kinds of enrichment. Um, okay, yes. I think that that's that's it. Thanks. Thanks for listening. Thank you for a nice talk. And we have some additional questions. So first one uh, by uh, Devish Karchevi who's asking uh, about that construction where you form a Markov category from a commutative monad. Mm -hmm. So if you have a commutative monad, the classic category is a Markov category. He's asking, would this work for co-monads too? And then he's adding the example of uh, the infinite jet monad. <laughs> so, I, yeah, I actually, I, I, I was looking at, at the, uh, the, no, wait, yeah. Well, the, the, the jet, jet co-monad, co I suppose, yeah. The, the chat co-monad a few days ago, and I haven't been able to understand what uh, its co-multiplication does. <laughs> but but I've had a feeling like like something similar may be going on there, but I don't know, in particular because I don't understand the chat co-monad. I see. Do we, oh well, maybe maybe, maybe simpler... that, let me let me ask. Do do you know of a good reference where the co-multiplication is explained in an intuitive way? Of the, I mean, I understand obviously that what the co-unit of the jet co-monad does, but the co-multiplication I haven't been able to. Maybe one thing that could help is that there is a discrete analog of the jet co-monad, hmm. which is of course much simpler, which is a string co-monad. So instead of looking at higher derivatives, it looks at points which are further in the past, hmm. like for the time instance. And there, of course, uh, there are a lot of references in computer science literature. I haven't written on that myself. But about the differentiable case, I don't know. Does anybody in the audience know? Maybe David himself? Uh, it depends what you mean by in intuitive. So, um, yeah, okay. I'll, 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 try to, I'll try to, maybe I'll send you an email if I can uh, think of a way to say Or, or to just, just any reference where the coma multiplication is, is treated in a, in a little more detail than um, what's on the end lab, for example. That would be yeah. great. Okay. I I mean, so I'll I'll have to check to see the, in the references. I know how mm. much it, it's um it's spelled out. So I'll let you know. Yeah. Thanks. Somebody's writing in the chat. Jets, and I think it's JS Lemay. Uh, Jets and differential linear logic by James Walbridge. It's in the chat. Ah. If it can help the the. The co-multiplication of the string co-monads looks at the history of the history, basically popping elements from the list. I don't know mm -hmm. if, if that's analog to the differentiable case, I suppose so, but I'm not sure. Then we have another question by Arthur. Uh, Arthur then said that he got it, but actually I wondered the same question too, and I didn't get it, so uh, let me ask it. Namely, 
if we if we form this uh, diagram category indexed by Z that has stochastic processes, then we want commutative diagrams, I suppose. So we want deterministic maps. Yes, right. But how does that then within the diagrams, but not as morphisms between diagrams? Yeah. But how does that then model stochastic processes? Right. Because they're deterministic in the horizontal direction, so to say. Yes, yes. This is actually exactly parallel to how um, stochastic processes are, are usually set up um, in that you have a um, basically also a diagram of measurable spaces and measurable functions. Um, and oh, the way to I think see. about that, and, and the way to think about that, uh, so also indexed by time, and the way to think about that is that um, the measurable space at time t just uh, represents all the things that have happened until that time. So it's, it's sort of all the, so in, in, in practice, it will often be the sort of product, the product space. And then as, as the maps you have, I may be confusing future and past at a moment. Yeah, sure. Practice, Maybe it's actually, really it really is backwards. You, you it's like a backward this. filtration. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm not sure, but yeah, forward or backward. Yeah, yeah. But, um, right. So, so then usually this would be a, an infinite, this, sorry, no, yeah. The, you would have these this products um, as the objects in a diagram, and then the product projections that, that just project out one uh, instant of time. The, the values of, of the process at one instant of time and forget that. And then I you see. can think like, and the, the point of them doing that is because that way you can say, um, as far as the morphisms of the diagram is concerned, you can talk about having a morphism of so stochastic processes where what happens at time t uh, is allowed to depend on all the things that have happened until then. But it's the natural, what the naturalian says, it is basically must be independent of the future. So, so it's allowed to depend on the past, but not on the future. I and, see. and that's also why one wants to have these, this actually, this, this, these big product spaces and then the deterministic projections going in between. I see, in that sense. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. That, uh, I think that answers my question and probably also Arthur. So, there is a couple of other questions. So if you can go back to this um, group objects in a Markov category. Mm -hmm. I think if I can correctly summarize the question, both questions of both uh, Davis, Spivak and Cole Comfort, please correct me if I don't. They're asking what the white dot is. And I suppose the white dot is just that you're picking some monoid object, in yes. group object in this case. Yes, exactly. So That's like, right. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Whereas the black dot is fixed. Is there a good example of this um, that you have in mind? Um, in a Markov category you like? Yeah. To be to be honest, for the group case at the moment, I don't know. <laughs> but uh, oh, yeah. Yes, of course. Sorry. Yeah. So so two things that one thing that I actually forgot to say here, just a caveat, is that this definition of if you take this as a definition of hypergroup, uh, then this is actually not as far as I understand at the moment, not equivalent to what people usually call hypergroup where the, the, where there, which has inverses in a weaker sense. Um, but I think one, so, so maybe I should be a little careful because I've just been writing this up yesterday and I've really carefully thought about all of these things yet. Um, I think one kind of example, interesting example of this kind of hypergroup is if you do this in, again, in, in, in um, no, sorry, that doesn't actually work. <laughs> yeah, no, then I, I don't know at the moment. Um, uh, under sort of weak assumptions, don't you have that isomorphisms are deterministic? Yes. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Do you, do you have any good example where this is actually not the case? Where isomorphisms are? Well, so maybe these examples are not good because they're maybe already too degenerate. 
But here in this category of co-monoids, isomorphisms are typically not deterministic. Um, okay. Because, well, a deterministic um, morphism in particular would have to be one that respects the co-multiplications, uh, intertwines the co-multiplications. But of course, you can have isom you can have isomorphic objects in C or, or dif different co-monoids, non-isomorphic co-monoid structures in the same object. Does that help? Yes, that makes sense. We have a question from Cole. Like, do do you not also need the bi-algebra rule? I suppose we're still talking about uh, internal group objects in a Markov category. Um. Yes, that's a good point. Yes, right. I think so. Mm -hmm. So, so this is hidden in uh, how one can consider models of any Lovio theory in a Markov category. I think. Um, so, yes, that's true. I, I was a bit too sloppy here. Yeah. Thanks. And then we have a question by Igil in the Zulip channel. So Igil mm -hmm. Rischel, I don't know if that should be discussed on the Zulip channel or here, but let me mention it. Uh, can you elaborate on your information theoretic example? Maybe if Igil can unmute himself, he can ask. Yeah, questions. sure. I mean, I'm just sort of, if you can go to that slide, uh, maybe with the, yeah. Um, yeah, so you say that we should have like compatible families of stochastic compatible in what sense? Uh, I suspect just in, in the sense of the obvious naturality condition. With so in, in that if you project Oh, your so it's about de like dependence. Yeah, okay, I see. Um, yeah, okay. No. Well, oh, okay, but maybe we can go into the details. Maybe we can write, that, write down the details in, in sure, sure. later. Let's not. What, what, okay. what I mean is just that if you, if you know that F, every Fn and Fn plus one should be compatible in a sense that if you project down right, from X sure. to the N plus one to N plus Y to N plus Oh, yeah, one, okay, okay, okay. Right. Crazy, crazy, crazy. Square. Um, so that Fn plus one sort of would extend Fn. And the asymptotic way. equivalence is some sort of like frequency. Uh, yes. Converges to yeah. Okay. Yes. Um, all right. Um, well, in, in in the sense of the um, at least the first try that that, that I would make is to um, define it as saying something like for every for all inputs. Um, the just a total variation distance on, on the outputs converges to zero as n goes to infinity. Sure. All right. But maybe one needs a little something a little more sophisticated along the lines of also then looking at logs of probabilities. And, I'm not sure. sure. All right. Um. Okay. Yeah, that answers my question. Okay, Arthur has another question. Please go ahead. Um, so actually about this slide, um, I don't see the connection between the bottom paragraph and the top two at all. Can you just give some insight what you were referring to, how such a category, if one exists, may describe what's going on regarding conditional entropy and probability? Yes. Uh, to be honest, I myself also don't. So, so this is why it's it's uh, kind of wild speculation at the moment. I also don't see much of a definite connection so far. Um, and in particular, I think that well, one what I'm hoping is that uh, the isomorphism classes of objects then will basically be no, sorry, I mean to say the uh, um, if you look at internal probability spaces, by which I mean. Um, objects equipped with a morphism from from the monoidal unit, then I think that the isomorphism classes of these should be in bijection of just the non-negative reals corresponding to just so a probability, finite probability space is asymptotically uniquely determined by its entropy. Um, and then the conditional entropy equation would suggest that maybe this also holds for the morphisms and that also morphisms are somehow just classified by by real numbers. Um, but I suspect that that's probably not the case. I see. Thank you. At least if one uses the definition at the bottom, whereas from one would expect at the top, um, 
one maybe would expect this to be the case that also the morphisms are classified by non-negative reals. And so maybe there's a bit of a tension there. Is, is, is this what you also noticed or? No, I mean, I was just asking. No, I was yeah. thinking about something else, but thank you. Okay. Very good. Any more questions for Tobias? Um, this is probably in the right smack in the middle of your paper, but um, is, is it true that if I have a, a category that supplies co-monoids and I fix any object, sorry, any monoid, and, and, and slicing, over, slicing over that monoid gives me a Markov category? If you, if you start with what? If I start with a category that supplies co-monoids, oh. mm -hmm. and I, I take, a, over. take an object with a monoid structure and slice over it, then it becomes terminal, and that should be fine, right? I haven't. I, I don't know. You haven't thought, thought of, about okay. 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 Thanks. Okay, any more questions? Can you can you then copy the stuff from the chat uh, in particular? Yeah, because of the, the chat command. Uh, I can say something about the chat command actually if you, but it, I mean, it's not as maybe as tangible as you want, but if you, um, if you view it uh, topo theoretically, it's literally just push forward to the DRAM space and then pull back and it's just a co-unit map is here. Um, this is induced by that, uh, that uh, junction that you have between the slice over your object and slice over the DRAM space of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let me, let me, okay. Um, right. The, 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 that's what I've seen, the, at least until now, not somehow not having really gotten up an intuition for that. But so um, then maybe I can ask, does it make sense to think of uh, especially in a sort of SDG topos theoretic spirit uh, of uh, the the jet space, the infinite jet space as mm -hmm. a sort of exponentiate, uh, yeah, as, as, a, uh, as an exponentiation by some kind of infinitesimal object. Yeah. And then yeah. the commonad arises also from, from that? I mean, it's when you ha when all of your um, formal neighborhoods are the same, this is yeah. true. So, okay. yeah. Yeah, okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Very nice. Any more questions or comments? Seems not. So, uh, first of all, let's thank the boss again. Very nice talk. And now, if you have any more offline questions, feel free to use the Zolib channel. Let me post the link in the chat.